Welcome back YouTubers. Today I have a bit of a challenge ahead. I had this old gramophone. I'll zoom out and show you. It's a lovely His Master's Voice gramophone from the 20s. This is in absolutely beautiful condition. The box itself or the cabinet has been French polished. This was done professionally about 25 years ago. You can see how lovely the chrome is. The sound box is in mint condition and it works fine. The diaphragm is excellent. I think it was replaced. I can't be sure but it, it sounds like it's fine. Um, it's got needles here. It's got needles in here. It's full of new needles. Uh, apparently this is the model 130 and this is a UK made gramophone. Now the problem with it is the spring has gone and it's been broken for some time and it's been in my brother's storage. Along with the gramophone he gave me this envelope and inside this envelope is a spring and inside the envelope was this document and the document says at the top JNM Wholesale in brackets Bedford Limited and it has uh, an address 16 Hardwick Road Bedford and a telephone number and an email and um, it has a number of parts here for diaphragms that have been listed so it's like a parts list effectively from the company um, there's also it's a kind of advertisement for uh, meets at Kempton Racecourse uh, the second and the last Tuesdays of each month so that was in there so if you wanted to meet other gramophone enthusiasts you could go along and the last thing that's most interesting is a list of parts with the prices but more interestingly at the top there's a date 15th of the 9th uh, in the UK we put the day first, so it's the 15th of the 9th month, 03. So that's 2003. So we're in 2020 now, so this is 17 years old, which means this coil spring was delivered 17 years ago and has stayed in the box ever since. So as with all these projects, I prefer to do them in the garage, keep the house tidy. So the first thing I thought I'd do is look at the spring. I'm going to open this up and we'll take a look. And there it is. Has a little bit of rust there, but uh, other than that, it's still pretty in pretty good shape. There's a few speckles, but that's nothing that's going to stop this from operating properly. It's got two cable ties to hold it together and this rather thick piece of wire which has been twisted there uh, to stop it from coming apart. So presumably that's the way they came from the factory. Now I have to undo that obviously and I've got to be very careful because uh, that's under tension and that could suddenly expand at a rapid speed and cause injury. I have an old cake pen and I thought I would place the spring inside the cake tin and do all the cutting while it's in there. So if it did expand, did suddenly free itself, it would come up against the edge of the tin. That's the theory, as opposed to sort of flying out or expanding and shooting across the room. I've decided what I'm going to do is I've got access right there to the wire so I can cut it about there. So I'm going to cover it up with these cloths, wear a glove, turn these around. Okay, it's still on it's still unraveling. Okay, all right, that's not good. <laughs> Actually, that was considerably less uh, trouble than I thought. So I'm still going to cover it up. 
there's still some tension there. Sure, how to get this out? I want to be able to hold it. There we go, I got it now. Now I've got it with two hands, I'm just going to loosen my grip. There we go, and let it unravel. Wow, there it is, folks. Job well done. It wasn't quite as nerve-wracking as I thought. I had sort of images of this thing flying out, but actually it uh, was e fairly easy to control it that way. So I'd recommend that approach to anybody that's doing this for the first time. I've switched to vinyl gloves, so I've got a little bit more control. And I'm just going to put this aside until I need it. But I'm going to put a tie around it so it doesn't come loose. I don't want it to fall on the floor or get damaged in any way so that'll just hold that together. I now have the gramophone in the garage so I can work on it. I need to get to the motor which is underneath this housing here. So the first thing I'm going to do is to remove the platter That just lifts up. I'll put it on the side here for now, but I will be returning that to the house. So these screws can come out. There's some linkage here. Um, which needs to be disconnected since all this is part of this plate that's coming out. So it looks like all you have to do is just push it down and you can move it. There are two handles here which must be designed to take this out and I can see now that it will come out. It's quite heavy. Yep. I'm used to seeing electric wires connecting things together, but there's nothing like that here. This just comes out. And you can see there on the back the motor, and that's the spring housing there, which we need to get into to replace the spring. I thought it might be interesting to show you inside. It's amazing how simple this gramophone is, really. So you have a diaphragm here, which vibrates sound waves are passed down here and down here is a horn which is sort of shaped to come around the corner and then it comes right up to the front of the machine that's where the sound comes comes out so really that's it you've got a way of producing the sound effectively just a horn and you have a way of turning the record or the 78 which is the motor, and then various ways to adjust the speed. There's no way to adjust the volume per se, except for using different types of needles. Um, the finer the needle, the quieter the sound, and the thicker the needle, the louder the sound. And the horn was originally painted gloss black, but you can see here how the oil and grease from the motor has in time come off and it's eaten through the paint, sort of corroded the paint. Something I thought was quite interesting about this machine is it still has this lubrication chart. You can see the motor here and basically this is just a pictorial representation of the motor and it tells you what to do. It says oil the bearings and it has a couple of lines that show you where the bearings are. Lubricate worm and gears with motor grease and it shows you where those are. Oil the bearings, again same thing, shows you the three bearing points oil friction leathers which uh, I suppose are brakes or something like that I'll have a look at those or it may be something to do uh, with governing the speed I'm not sure at this point oil bearings again here place motor grease in the threads of the winding shaft that's the uh, where the handle goes 
And it, last thing here, it says lubricate winding gears and ratchet with motor grease. And it shows you where to do it. And then, I can't read that, it's blacked out, but I imagine it says the same thing, lubricate bearings or oil bearings. So they're quite specific about it, and it looks like someone's been quite gung-ho and enthusiastic with their oil and grease. Before I do any job like this, I always go around and take photographs of everything, particularly the way things go together. And even when I'm assembling them, I might take more photos. And they may prove to be very useful at a later date. The motor is identified by a number right here. So this is HMV's uh, motor number 32. The cylinder here houses two springs, I've discovered. And I only have one replacement one, so I'm not altogether sure what the problem is. I'll have to take this out take the springs out and have a good look and see what's going on. I've got a socket here, 7 sixteenths of an inch. That's the old material. Seems to fit perfectly. This one is spinning, so there's a screw here. Put a screwdriver in there just to hold it. There seem to be only three nuts and bolts holding this on. So that lifts up and this comes free. Now you might also notice there's a felt washer here and there's two missing there. Um, so they may be on the bottom of the motor. Oh, there's one take that one off as well. Two. And there should be a third one. It may it may be missing. Ah, there it is. I'll just quickly knock together a small stand. There's two bits of wood I had left over from a bed build I've just completed. And just cut a groove here for the spindle to go in. It's like a little platform. It gives me something to uh, to work with um, when I come to disassembling it and cleaning it and that sort of thing. Yeah. So the first thing that needs to be done is this screw needs to be removed. I also put a couple of screws in here into the frame just to hold it, hold the motor so it won't fall off. So there's a tiny little screw there. Now that I believe goes down into this uh, sort of axle or shaft that runs all the way through. Now the next thing is to try to remove this. Now, there are some markings on it like someone's hit it before with, with a metal point like this. Now, it doesn't need a great deal of effort to remove it. as far as I can bang it through and there it is so that's the axle it's covered in oil weirdly enough I thought that might I think I just sold something on eBay so this should now lift off which it does quite easily I will clean this up and lubricate it at some point. This um, thing here that pivots here if you take it apart and replace it the hook end is on the right. I'll clean that later. I'll put this aside. I'm going to turn my attention now to this the spring cylinder. 
By the way, you will not do this work without getting covered in grease, so I suggest you wear some nice rubber gloves. There we go. Those two pieces come out. They could do with a nice clean. I'm sure this motor will be very happy when it's all cleaned and re-greased. Now the next thing is there's this um, pin that's stuck here. Weirdly enough this one's not fitting very well. There's a large gap all the way around here which is interesting. i put these on just so that I can protect my hand. Um, I'm going to take this out. Oops, I've got a, I don't know whether you can see that on the end of the screwdriver. There's a gramophone needle. It's magnetic. Get back in there. Get in there. There we go. All this has to be cleaned, of course. And now the next thing is to remove this. And I suspect the best way to do that would be from this side. I can see the spring and the spring actually will push back inside like that, it's loose. Um, and the same on this side interestingly enough, there seems to be um, a hole through which the axle passed. I thought I might be able to get from here to the other side, and I think I can. So what I'm going to do is just tap it I'm just going to tap it like so. There you go. And that comes off pretty easily. And we can see inside there, looking fabulous, one of the springs, which appears to still be hooked in place, interestingly enough. Which makes me wonder if there's anything wrong with it. It seems like there's lots of oil in there and not grease as I would have expected. This just looks like a very runny oil. Okay, um, I've got to take this out. There's no way to open this so I assume that this spring comes out. There's a separating piece of metal in there. You can see it right there. I assume that comes out and then the spring behind it comes out. Looking at this spring, the spring itself is not broken. It's firmly attached to the wall of the spring cylinder over here. There's nothing wrong with that. And this end here is fully shaped. There's nothing distorted or bent about it. However, What's happening is that when this is inserted, this bit here is supposed to hook into this step. And as this turns, it winds the spring. But it's missing it, it's not engaging with the step. And it seems to be something to do with the way this part here has opened up. In other words, this, this bit here should have a tighter curl. If you look at the replacement spring, You can see how tight that is there, but when this is inserted, well, I think you'd agree, if I can't get this through um, without a bit more force, then uh, this is obviously going to set on the step the way it's supposed to. So it's almost as if the other spring is in some way it, it's been 
stretched over time or something. I'm not quite sure why. And I'm sure, to be honest, that the other spring could be repaired. I'm sure with a little bit of force, this could be tightened up. Uh, maybe heated and forced into place with a pair of pliers or something when it's hot. I'm sure it would do the job. The further you get, the more it seems to want to spring out. I'm trying to keep it assembled so it stays kind of lined up. I don't want it to get all knotted up. It's almost popping out at this point. That's the first one out. I'm going to tie that up. There's a plate here that separates the two springs. There's also a gap along the edge of this plate where it's been cut away. And I assume that you have to turn the plate to line up with this piece here so you can take it out. So I'm just going to do that. That should lift out. Voila. And now I'm going to tackle the second spring. I thought I might try to demonstrate how this spring works. This piece of metal has a notch cut in it, which lines up with the notch at the end of the spring. So as this comes in, the notch sits right inside that piece of metal. And as this spring is wound, this starts to hug this spindle, for want of a better word, in the centre, it starts to pull tight on it, which in turn prevents the spring from slipping out of this notch, so it sort of holds it in place. And the more you tighten it, the more that happens. And you can see the spring pulling from the outer wall towards the centre, and that's how the tension is built up. And then I can just release it. You see? So as long as it's under tension, this spring is held tight against this spindle, so it shouldn't come loose. Okay. 
Right, here we go. Wish me luck. Much the same thing, it sort of starts to jump out the further you get to the edge. tricky bit, this is the last bit. There we go. Wow, that's the second one out. It's quite difficult because of the fact that it's so far inside. I imagine it's going to be difficult to put it back, but not impossible. I just poured some petrol into this bucket. I'm just using that to clean this up. I found it to be very good for this sort of thing. Just eats through grease in a flash. Probably leave it to soak for a little bit, it would probably be better, but it's not absolutely necessary. Let's take that out for a second, give me some more room.
little wipe. There we go. That's as good as new. It's ready to refit. So it took about 10 minutes to clean this lot up. I think you'll agree it looks very nice. Got rid of all the grease. These are all ready to go back. Now I'm going to wipe the springs down and then I'll be ready to put this back together. So I'll put a little petrol on this rag. I'm just going to clean this off. Coming off real fast. Oops. Get the idea, I'm just going to go all the way through that spring. Came off pretty quickly, it's all nice and shiny, it looks almost new, you'd never know it wasn't new. I'm interested to know if it's the same size as the new one. I took a piece of string and I attached it to the centre and I just wound it around the spring. It goes all the way to the end over here. Excuse me, there it is over there. So what I've got here is the length of the spring. I can measure it to find out. I'm curious to know how long it is. And then I'll do the same thing with the new one and that should tell me if they're the same length. So I wound the string around the new spring and as it turned out the old spring is this much longer. I thought I'd just measure that. It's two feet, 24 inches. About 61 centimeters. Now I don't know whether that's going to make any difference. Um, both springs pulling together, I don't think there'd be a problem. But it is interesting that uh, although this was an, a replacement, it really isn't the same length. But I thought while I was at it I should measure the width, just to be sure that it will fit. I need to make sure that it will fit back into the cylinder. The original spring was 16 feet when I measured the string. And the replacement is 14 feet. So uh, there's a difference. I'm about to put the spring back into the cylinder and I bought this grease. It's called GP Graphite Grease by a company called C. Bennis and it says here made in England so this is a UK product. People who still make these springs today recommend you use a graphite grease or a molybdenum grease but they say the graphite is best and it says right here that it's designed for sliding elements basically means things that aren't cogs but are just sandwiched together and slide backwards and forwards which is exactly what this is. If you look inside here you can see two hooks like bracket hooks and that will tell you which way the spring goes. This one here has a hook going that way which will clip onto the bottom. That's the only way it's going to stay hooked. Clearly getting the first one hooked in is an art form. So I'm going to move it away from the hook and get the first piece in. And then maybe, just maybe, I can get it to slide into place. That's it, that's the way to do that, it would seem. Inside the other one, so it expands back into place. Try to keep the 
sole. problem I'm having is that the tripod is too close. And I'm not getting this to slide down all the way. I'd hoped it would. So I have to force that down later. It really has a mind of its own this spring. I don't think I'm going to be able to get it to see all the way to the bottom until it's all in there and then I'm probably going to have to tack it down with a piece of wood or something. Yeah, I think you've got to keep feeding it in, like I was doing. I guess if I had a piece of advice, it would be don't let go. Wow, there it is. Some of the wines aren't all the way in. So what I'm going to do is place this inside, use that and a hammer wooden mallet to gently tap them down. I'm going very slowly. I don't want to damage anything. I'm hardly hitting it at all really. Just gently tapping it. Right, that seems like that's lovely and flat now, and I can see it's hooked on perfectly. Move this out the way. I'm just using this. I can scoop some up. I'm sort of pushing it into the area where the spring is. Getting quite a lot in there. 
I'm not trying to work it down into the spring. That's where it's going to do the most good at the beginning. Feels like I'm putting too much in, but I think I've got to pack it pretty tight, you know, so that as it moves, there's a lot of extra free grease that will uh, get right down into those springs to sort of coat the whole thing. I've pretty much filled it up. Um, I think we can be sure that it will squeeze out if there's too much. And this is going in. There we go. Now this one is going in the other way, sort of going in anti-clockwise. Side so that it will flatten against the side of the cylinder. Oh dear. It's got tangled. This would be 150 times easier on a bigger surface.
Okay, you this in real time. Never take my hands off it. I'm just trying to keep a hand on there in case it decides to spring out. And even at this point, it's not ready to pop in yet. And then it is. There you go. So, you saw it. It's the first time I've ever done it. If I can do it, you can do it. Well, first of all, I'm just checking to make sure that the spring is latched on and I can see very clearly that it is. So that's excellent. I'll put a bit of grease down in that part. Just to help it. I'm just working my way around. Forcing what I can down into the spring. Although that's not much because it's fairly tightly wound. And as it starts to move and pull away from the wall of the cylinder, um, this grease will get dispersed throughout the spring. So they say. <laughs> I mean, it does seem a bit odd at this point in time that uh, the spring doesn't have much grease on it. And yet the first wind is done almost dry, you know. It would seem better if it was all um, it was all lubricated before it was wound. Um, I'm going to let you into a secret. I did actually try that. I tried lubricating the spring before I put it in, and it was really difficult to put the spring in. It was slipping and sliding all over the place, and in fact, it was a little bit dangerous. So I can see why people might uh, do it dry. You know, it's obviously a safety thing, have more control. I didn't include that in the video, uh, but the first time I tried it, I did um, grease the spring and realized after about two wines that it wasn't great. Okay. Now, I've got a little bit more in. I guess the worst thing that can happen is it can ooze out the edges and end up uh, on the bottom of the gramophone. Which I can check later, just to make sure it's okay. Right, so there we go. So the last thing is to put this back. The little neck sticks out to the top, not this way, this way. That went in fairly easily. I'm just going to repeat my tapping process to make sure that the spring is properly seated. Just gently though. Seems a bit high over here. I'm running my thumbnail around the inside of the rim and I'm checking to see if that groove is accessible. I can feel it with my thumbnail. It's, it's there all the way around. So that means that this clip, which goes in next, should fit without any issue. Let's fit that on. I'd probably do this with gloves on, but there we go. All right, I believe that's the job done. So I've been washing this for a few minutes. I find this petrol is really good for getting this grease off. I can see the metal work is nice and clean underneath it all. I'm going in very gently around the governor here. Just, I don't want to have to change it or adjust it. So um, just gently, gently brushing it, getting rid of all the old grease and oil. And I'll be giving it a new coating of oil and grease. It's a little bit delicate here, so be careful. We've got some more gears here, They're pretty grotesque. A lot of grease and dirt here. You can see how quickly that 
covers with a bit of petrol. Just seems to eat right into the grease. So you get the idea, basically um, it's giving it a bath, it's giving it a nice bath, breaking down all the dirt. Well I think I've finished cleaning it now. I used acetone in a jar with a paintbrush and I just splashed it all over it, wiped it off and basically it's pretty good. And now I'm going to reassemble this and it's probably at times like this it's a good idea to refer to any photographs you might have taken. Um, I know that this goes this way. That's a good start. I also know that this engages with the cogs on this side. So the first thing is for me to slip this in. Now you can see the notch here on this bit. And you can see in there that little bit of the spring that kind of bends back on itself that's in, supposed to engage in this. So, with a little bit of finagling, should be possible to insert that. Ah, let's just move this out of the way a second. I can see what's stopping that going in is the, sp the spring there, so if I can just move that out of the way. I might have to come up from it, the inside to do that. I just need to move the spring to the side just a little bit. There we go. So I'm moving the spring out of the way so that I can slot this in. There we go. So that's that. And that's engaging with the spring. I can feel it. So that's good. Right, so I can feel that catching on the spring when I turn it that way. And this is catching on the spring when I turn it that way. So both the springs, as far as I can tell, are operational. And that's the good news, that's what this is all about, trying to fix that. So the next thing is to lower it into here. And then we have to push this, this bar through and engage the screw. So, um, I've laid that back in there, just have to lift this side slightly to get the um, pin to drive through, just tapping it gently. Okay, it's come through to this side now, there we go. So by putting the whole vertical pointing upwards, I knocked that through, and I was able to put a bradle in here, and just to sort of nudge it slightly, you can see it moving. So I think the hole is where it needs to be. Also the uh, little screw that goes in has a sort of tapered point to try to centre the axle on the screw. So, well, there you go. So for the fact that the screwdriver is a little bit too big. At this point I'm just greasing up the motor. I'm using automotive grease actually. I'm just squeezing it on these cogs here. Working it in. This seems to be turning just fine, it's latching the way it should do, and the governor's spinning. I'm not going to uh, force that too much because I need to get more grease and oil on before I run it. So here we go, I'm just running this down there. Just turn it a little bit. Put some more on. Just give this a wind. There we go. I'm applying it to this part and it'll work its way around the cog as it turns. Try to get some down there as well. So the worm gears, this one and this one, they're called worm gears, I forgot for a second, um, they have to be greased 
and that will transfer grease onto here. I may do that too with a brush. I'm going to put a bit more grease over there. Whoops. Let's take it off with a brush. Just work that in there. Get my hand out of the way. Just I have to work with this a little bit because you want to make sure you get it everywhere it's supposed to be. At the moment it's just dumping everything up to here. I might just go around here, just putting some on here. So operating the motor just to move these uh, cogs into a place where you can lubricate them. That's a good idea. Just work it in with a brush. So by this point, when I've done this bit here, I've got the entire this big drive cog here has been covered. Running lovely and quiet. Just clean this up a bit. I have got it in places where perhaps I should have got it. Just remove those. Um, the other thing is I have some Singer oil. You have to oil the bearings. Now according to the diagram um, you have to oil here on this side too seems to be working nicely this here is rubbing on where where the cogs were so that needs to be oiled same on the other side, so it's very difficult to get to that. Um, this worm gear needs to be some more grease up there. Needs to have the bearing oiled at this point here and underneath here as well. It's a bit more difficult to get to that. This here needs to be oiled. Turn it on to work the oil in. Okay, I'm going to turn it upside down so the oil will sink into this bearing here. Let's put a little bit more on there. And start it up again.
They also recommend putting a little bit of grease in the part where the handle goes. I suppose it's so that you can undo this, it doesn't get stuck, which is fine. I can do that as well. Of course, I run out. I can dig some out, put some in there. Might put a little bit of oil here, just where this moves. A little bit there, so that's fully lubricated. Referring back to the oiling chart, it did say that you have to oil the friction leather, which is that little bit of leather there that presses on this wheel here. Oddly enough, I suppose that stops it wearing out. So a drop of oil there. So the camera cut out, but what I did is I uh, wound this up about three times and then I put a tape measure actually under here, which just lifted this lever so that um, it would unwind. And I did this three times just to make sure that this is all settling in nicely. The springs are getting evenly lubricated and settling in. Now I'm going to put it back on the uh, panel here. So first thing I have to do is to unscrew it Whoops! Unscrew it from here. This is my little temporary sort of stand for it, which is quite useful and was worth making, I think. I would recommend it. Okay, now there's a hole in this plate where this thing goes. So, oh, I'm getting grease on me now. That goes like that. And then it drops into place like so. Now we mustn't forget that there were three washers. These were um, felt washers that were underneath the motor. And I assume that's to stop vibration from carrying through where it would make noise, particularly as this is wood, it's sort of hollow. It'd be like a drum banging away. Uh, I don't want to get grease all over myself, but I think it's inevitable. I'll hold it there. So line these up with the holes, draw this back, and there's another one, there it is. And then from underneath I'm feeding these bolts. left now out of all the parts are the four chrome plated screws. I'm just snugging these up for one last time. Well here we go, back inside. Putting it back. Using the little handles to drop it in. That's quite a nice idea. Um, this piece here Okay, this has moved somewhat, I'm not quite sure how or why, there we go. This piece here needs to be pushed underneath, over there, there we go, so that now operates properly. I have four lovely screws, make sure that these are lined up properly. There are no cups for these screws, surprisingly. I thought there might be some fancy cups, but no such thing. I'm not over tightening them, just to hold it. Appropriate. 
Now this is in lovely condition, this piece of uh, historic musical equipment. There we go, that's proper. Alright.